Hi, Siobhan. How are you doing today? Good. How are you doing? Good, good. So today marks the one week anniversary since we did our blood testing drive at Low Carb USA in San Diego. Did you have fun? I did have fun. It was a lot of work, but I'm really glad it worked out the way it did. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, and I kind of want to call it a beta. And as with all betas, there might have been a few bumps. Uh, but overall, we managed to capture quite a lot of data. So um, we're going to kind of go through each of the tests that we did, sort of why it is that we like it and generally what they do. But at the same time, uh, before we get started, usual caveat, we're not medical professionals. This isn't medical advice. Uh, we're just citizen scientists, and we really appreciate the participation of everybody involved in helping us get this data, not just for themselves, but also for the value of the community. Agreed. So. Let's go ahead and go uh, with the first test, C-peptide. And you know what? I'm going to kind of couple C-peptide and insulin, both tests that we got. And the reason we like C-peptide and insulin is because, well, frankly, it is uh, insulin in particular is the, I guess you could say, the most muscle of the hormones in your body. It is an anabolic hormone. And, of course, hyperinsulinemia is often associated with disease. Uh, we're working on lots of different things associated with that, as are so many other people, and trying to better understand insulin resistance. Yeah. In a tweet recently, I actually called uh, high insulin a check engine light. If it is constantly on, I would like to know why. And this is also why we like a fasted insulin number. I realize that um, a lot of people, maybe not people who follow us closely, but some people get surprised when we press to have uh, fasted numbers, particularly at say 12 hours or 14 hours. And as of yet, I've never been able to find anywhere in the literature anything that says why it would be a good idea to have elevated insulin after 12 to 14 hours fasted. Uh, so that's something to bear in mind. Now, insulin has about a five hour half-life, I believe, and C-peptide actually has about a 30 minute half-life. And without getting too much into the details, uh, C-peptide is closely related to um, uh, insulin metabolism. And in that sense, it's kind of, it can be in some ways a little more of a reliable marker because of its longer half-life. So that's something right. worth bearing in mind. The other thing to mention um, is sometimes insulin can be elevated if you are sick. I know there was someone at the blood testing drive who was sick at the time of the draw, so just keep that in mind. Um, if you were sick during that time, um, just be aware it may be wise to retest when you are healthy again. Absolutely. Next, we're going to go just in alphabetical order to CBC, which st stands for complete blood count. Uh, and we like the more expanded one with the differentials. Uh, and I'm going to see if I can pull it up here real quick. We're not going to actually go through all of the tests of the CBC because there's actually quite a lot. But both Siobhan and I like it because it is a good kind of comprehensive immunological panel. There's a lot of goodies in here that um, something's off if you're sick. Uh, many different kinds of illnesses will start setting off one or more of these markers in many ways. Uh, the ones we probably look at the most are WBC and RBC, which is white blood count and red blood count, respectively. Uh, I'm especially interested in things like neutrophils. And, uh, and I really like to see um, if other markers like, uh, like hemoglobin are different than what they usually are, monocytes, uh, things along those lines. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, it is something I keep an eye on. Again, if you're sick, it's probably going to pop up as weird. But if you're not sick and it pops up with something, I kind of take that for myself as a let's investigate further and kind of see what's causing this sign which a lot of these markers are that we're going to be getting into. Next up, uh, we've got the comprehensive metabolic panel. Uh, I like this for many different reasons, but of course I just like, like, like metabolism for many reasons. And the first and most prominent one in the CMP is glucose, of course. And what the fasted glucose level is, is always of great curiosity to us. Uh, I'm probably more forgiving than most of a higher than expected glucose reading, especially if you're a lean mass hyperresponder. It's very commonly in the 90s for lean mass hyperresponders or even low 100s. And I won't unpack that too much, but I believe this comes down to a likely adaptive glucose sparing because often this is coupled with very low insulin, very low C-peptide, which to me suggests that this is by design on the part of the body. 
Uh, another one of enormous interest lately is BUN, which is short for blood urea nitrogen, which I'm going to hand off to Siobhan for. She has some good thoughts on that. Yeah. So one thing that's been noted by a couple people, uh, Megan Ramos is one of them, is that she'll sometimes see BUN elevated in low carbers. And I've seen this in myself as well. Um, sometimes it can be related to hydration status. I've heard that a couple times. But I also suspect it's relating to protein intake. Um, so if you have higher protein intake, then it could be higher. Um, yeah, so what Megan said she does is if it does come back elevated, she double checks other renal markers. Um, EGFR is one of them, I believe, uh, just to double check that everything looks normal, and then she kind of shrugs it off after that. You know, what's fascinating about that is I'm just now starting a new carnivore experiment that should, if it all goes as planned, last a month. And I believe my protein percentage will end up being much higher. We'll actually see where it lands because it's an ad libitum uh, experiment. But I'll be curious to see if my own BUN changes. Uh, another couple markers I really like in this panel are AST and ALT. Both are liver enzymes and can often be high uh, due to a little bit of an inflammatory response, but they can they can likewise be um, they can be elevated and even offset substantially in the case of say something like alcoholism. But regardless, I do think that there's something to keep an eye on, and if they're elevated, to you know check into a little bit further. Yeah, another thing to note is that they can be elevated from recent exercise. I actually know of someone who had super high numbers, and her doctor was kind of freaking out but she was a heavy lifter, so she retested without exercise for a week and they did come back normal. Now, CRP is short for C-reactive protein, and that's a good segue from what Siobhan just said because C-reactive protein also is an acute phase reactant and it too can be elevated uh, where you've had like intensive exercise. However, can also be elevated if, if you are dealing with an immunological response, especially if it's chronic. It's something that you want to be aware of. I like it because it's an extremely sensitive needle. Sure, almost anything can set it off. So even if it can be high for a good reason, such as exercise, it can be high for a huge variety of different uh, immun immunological responses. It's not prognostic in that way in that it can tell you what the specific origin of it is. But in its non-specific way, it actually is a great way to rule out a lot of things um, with inflammation kind of all at once. If it's extremely low, generally speaking, you just don't have a problem on that front. Yeah, I would agree. So we're going to kind of skip over lipids and get to it at the end because we like to just save the best for last. Um, well, let's go ahead and go to LP little a, which is technically a lipoprotein. Uh, but for that, I, I feel I just can't say a word without passing it back off to Siobhan. <laughs> so lipoprotein little a is considered a cardiovascular risk factor, but there are a couple things to know about it just in short. For one, there can be a genetic baseline. Um, so generally what they say is if you have high levels, you can test your parents, for example, and see what their levels are to see if that is the case. Um, in that case, I would expect a wide variation in just everybody who's gotten tested. Um, there does also seem to be a metabolic component just from my own testing. Um, so impacted by how much fat you're eating, how much fat you're not eating, that kind of thing. Um, and then the other thing is, as far as risk goes in the studies that I've seen, it does seem to also interact with HDL levels, so are the HDL levels high, and then also Framingham risk score. And I believe on our report tool, you can calculate the Framingham risk score. Is that correct? Um, yes, correct. Yeah. So if you have high levels, you can use the report tool and see how you stack up on that. Um, yeah. And I'll, we'll provide links in the description, I would guess. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that you're also doing a full presentation on LP little a at low carb Houston. Is that right? Yes, that is correct. I think a lot of people, myself included, we're going to be pretty excited about that. Uh, so moving on, let's go ahead and get into free fatty acids, which ma, 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 we didn't actually get those markers in. Apparently, they need to be frozen samples, and uh, the service we were using, um, I think, just made an honest mistake in that they thought it wasn't, it, that it needed to be room temperature um, samples. So 
Unfortunately, we didn't get free fatty acids. However, that said, I definitely want free fatty acids in future tests because it's a measure of fat in the blood that is not triglycerides, which is to say not carried by lipoproteins, is instead carried by uh, the most prominent protein in your uh, bloodstream known as albumin. But that's, that is something that's very central to the energy model because uh, I would speculate that free fatty acids would be much higher, especially for those people who are powered predominantly by fat. Yeah. The other thing I've also enjoyed recently looking at is pairing insulin levels with free fatty acid levels. Um, if you are insulin sensitive in your fat tissue, you would presumably have low levels of free fatty acids compared to the insulin level that you have. So if both are elevated, um, I generally find that interesting and something to look at a bit further. Definitely. Let's go ahead and move on to ferritin. Uh, ferritin, of course, is known as an acute phase reactant, and thus it's a good one to go ahead and get as part of the, I believe, Siobhan, you said it's part of your trio, your big three. Yeah, my big three inflammatory markers. Uh, that would be CRP, ferritin, and lipoprotein little a. Right. Uh, so this will be the, the last of the three that we're covering. Uh, it's, of course, brought up often in relation to having either uh, excessive amounts suggesting that you have uh, an iron overload, or if it's very low, that possibly you're anemic. And that said, Siobhan and I were talking off air before this, and we're both a little bit skeptical as to whether that's... Um, as cut and dry as we might think. We've definitely come across a wide variety of different results of ferritin, even in spite of people having very comparable diets to each other. Uh, this includes myself, by the way. Even before I had gone on a low-carb diet, my ferritin levels were generally around 500, which was just above range. And for a little while after I'd gone low-carb, it was closer to like the 700s. Now it's ultimately found its way slowly down to somewhere in the neighborhood of the 200s. And the only thing that I've been able to recall, which I've mentioned a few times in some podcasts, is that the one thing, the one substantial change I'd made is I uh, kind of got my electrolyte house in order. Uh, can, I consume a lot more salt and other electrolytes right now. And I generally feel better. And that seems to have been around, it's, it may be coincidental, but that seems to have been around the time that ferritin had gone a little bit lower. All of that said, there wasn't any other lifestyle change I made that could make the lower level of ferritin make sense. Um, right. and worth, worth noting just real quick, I also did a, um, a blood donation test where I actually tested my ferritin before I donated blood, and then I tested my ferritin a few days after I donated blood, and I didn't actually see a substantial difference. That's interesting. Um, another thing to mention is ferritin can go up if you have been fasting for quite a long time. Um, so when I did my seven days of fasting, and I know you saw a similar, Dave, um, that's actually when I saw my highest level, if I remember right. The other highest level would have been, again, when I was sick for obvious reasons. Um, so I do know there were a couple people who had come into the blood testing drive very, very fasted. So that is something to keep in mind as well. And yes, mine got as high as the 900s. That was an extraordinarily high number and the highest I'd ever had by far when I did the two and a half day fast, the only time I've done a multi-day fast yet. Next, we've got uh, GGT, which is gamma, I always mess this up, gamma glutamyl uh, transpeptidase test. Anyway, uh, this test basically is um, also something that can be associated to damage in the liver. In fact, uh, oftentimes if you're consuming uh, lots of things that are toxic, such as alcohol, uh, <laughs> it's, it ends up often getting a lot of doctors will order this as one of the adjunct tests to kind of get a sense of the toxicity that's going on there. So it's also a great test to have. I definitely recommend uh, Ivor Cummins, who talks about uh, GGT and ferritin quite a bit, uh, particularly in his own health journey and the things that he was able to discover as well. Uh, after that, we've got glucagon. Glucagon, unfortunately, was the other uh, test we didn't um, fully get. That uh, it's probably low priority to most other people, but we're certainly interested in it. Uh, you may remember Ben Bickman's fantastic talk from last year in Breckenridge, where he talks about the glucagon insulin index because, of course, both of them are sort of um, pulling at each other in a lot of ways. Uh, glucagon, when it goes up, means there's more lipolysis, more fat release, tends to be more common in a fasted state. Whereas insulin, as it comes up, glucagon goes down. Insulin inhibits lipolysis. 
And of course, there's many other different things, including things associated with um, uh, the immune response. And Siobhan, you've definitely been reading up a lot on where there are circumstances, particularly immunologically, where insulin and glucagon could be high together. Isn't that right? Yes. And I've been seeing this in data from other people as well, where they'll have both high insulin and high glucagon at the same time. And usually where I'm seeing this is actually in people who are diabetic, which is about what I would expect. Um, it does seem to also happen with infection, but I haven't been able to test that for myself. Um, but yeah, it is interesting and I definitely want more data on it. Absolutely. So A1C may be the one test most people watching this already know enough about. It's often a marker for diabetes. It's of course the a measure of the glycation of the hemoglobin. And uh, it's, it's supposed to be kind of a three month average uh, for those of us, and I'm sure Siobhan's included, who actually shell out a little extra money so that we can get it tested frequently. We find that no, it does kind of move up and down. In fact, it seems to have, um, if I introduce carbs for one of these carb experiments and I flip the switch fairly hard, I'll actually see it go from say like a 5.6 to a 6.0 in a matter of days or a week. And I've seen that at least a couple times, I believe. Uh, yeah. It's also worth noting that there is, again, just like with any test, a range of error, some normal fluctuation that's going to go on. So occasionally I have seen people who said, well, I had a 5.1 before and now I have a 5.3. Things are getting worse. So I don't know what to do. That is probably variation. And in that case, what I would do is get a follow up after some time, verify that, because um, sometimes it'll go up and down a little bit just day to day, week by week. Trends are the important thing there. They definitely are. Uh, now let's go ahead and talk about our favorite, the lipid panel. Now many people were asking why we didn't do an NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance test in this, which of course can break out the particle sizes. There's really a couple reasons. One was because uh, it's a bit more expensive and therefore would have added to the total cost. The other is, uh, Siobhan and I have been more and more of the mind, certainly I have, that it's not as useful as I would have thought at the beginning of this whole journey. Look, what it comes down to is this. If your triglycerides are low and your HDL is high, in that scenario, I feel very confident I can pretty closely predict what your particle count will be. The reason is because it suggests that there's actually a metabolic reason for the lipids you're showing me right now because you probably are fat adapted and likely insulin sensitive because the high HDL low triglycerides uh, suggest you're probably operating on lower insulin under the curve. And therefore, um, as, the equation is, as the equation goes that I like to mention, basically your LDLC can predict your LDLP by this measure. You can take your LDLC, multiply it times 10, and whatever that number is, it's going to be plus or minus 15%. It will be your resulting LDL particle count. I've seen this in my own data through now well over, gosh, I'm coming up on 120 tests. And uh, Siobhan, you've now seen it yourself in a number of tests. This with us tracking closely against our food. Uh, so the only time in which they tend to be very offset is if there was a change in the equation inside that five-day to three-day gap, which I don't want to get into the mumble-jumble, but for those of you who know the um, – uh, the energy model, you know what I'm talking about. Longer, I guess you could say the, the, the short version of this is simply this. It's just not as useful as I originally thought it was, and a lipid panel really does suffice to at least determine, okay, are they in likely a metabolically flexible mode while being also fat adapted? They are. Okay, then the, the panel, the particle count just isn't going to be as useful. And so that's kind of why we opted to Go ahead and put in some of these other more interesting tests that I think will uh, unpack more for us. Yeah. Basically, I'd sum it up is often, especially in metabolically healthy people, NMRs are redundant compared to the lipid panel. So it's not actually providing more information. It's just restating the same information in a different way. And personally, I like redundancy. But if I'm someone who's getting a bunch of blood work and trying to keep it as inexpensive as possible, yeah, I'm that's why it was not included. Now let me go ahead and state what these days pretty much I always look to first in a lipid panel. I go straight to triglycerides. Triglycerides I consider to be the most important marker you could be looking at in a lipid panel, but with the usual caveat 
that you should not look at any single marker in isolation. Now, insulin and triglycerides, they're super relevant, in my opinion, to this larger story of where your metabolism is at. And of course, triglycerides are telling a story about how much your energy stores are making it into the tissue they're designed for. So once again, in the context of having 12 to 14 hours of a fasted state, I would expect that you had a lot of energy parked into your tissues, and for that matter, that's utilizing it fairly well. If your triglycerides are extraordinarily high in that circumstance, then I typically think there's a problem. And we have a great article. I don't want to go through all the different uh, touch points now, but for those people who don't already know, you can go to cholesterolcode.com slash high dash TG. And there we actually have uh, four different criteria that tend to be something we'd like everybody to look towards in case they do have high triglycerides. A close second is HDL. HDL being, um, of course, high density lipo, or sorry, uh, high density lipoprotein uh, cholesterol levels. And what do you think about HDL? Do you think that's a pretty important marker, Shabba? Uh Yes, but it does require some context. Um, so I'm actually a good example of this. For a long time, even on keto, my HDL levels were pretty low. I started out with it at 33, and usually it's recommended for women to have it above 50. Um, but over time, it has come up. So generally, when I see low HDL on a panel, the first question I ask is, what's your history? Um, has it always been that low, or did it suddenly go down? If it's suddenly gone down and there's not really any dietary change that could explain it, and usually with that, it's lower fat, um, then I kind of want to investigate more, see what's causing that. Um, yeah, persistently low levels, as far as the studies I've read, you know, it could be genetic, it could be coming back from something. It's something I kind of give time and keep an eye on. Um, yeah, and then... There is some controversy over, you know, high HDL associated with higher mortality, but I have actually read those studies um, quite a few times at this point, and generally what they're correlating with in that case is alcohol intake, because chronic alcohol consumption can artificially raise HDL, and that um, if you're chronically drinking a lot of alcohol, it's not surprising your mortality is higher. As Siobhan well knows, I actually get very frustrated about this. I, I think it's, it's, there's words I could use that I'm not going to use, but I'll just say that I, I find it unacceptable to have any study that's making an association of HDL with mortality that doesn't account for that extraordinarily commonly known confounder of high HDL with alcoholism. So that's, that's certainly something I, I think everybody should be mindful of. Now, of course, the one that we get asked about the most is LDL. And the interesting thing about this is, uh, as Siobhan well knows, as many people who have been following my more recent risk uh, presentations knows at this point, before recently, I would have said that LDL is just much less relevant to triglycerides and HDL. Ironically, while I'm not making a claim of causality, ironically, higher LDL, when grouped with high HDL and low triglycerides tends to have a better outcome than lower LDL. Again, this is associative, not a claim of causality. But with that said, that does mean that at a minimum, that's, it's a little more of a full frontal challenge to the existing lipid hypothesis, hypothesis as it stands. For more on that, you can, just, you can just Google Dave Feldman and Salt Lake and you'll find the presentation that I did uh, recently where I kind of talk about this and I unpack it a bit more. Uh, but needless to say, LDL is fascinating to me, but per the energy model, I think that there's actually a metabolically rational reason it could be higher, particularly when HDL is high and triglycerides are low. Right. The other small note I wanted to make for LDL levels is that reverse correlation with higher LDL and lower mortality is consistent across the board with women in general. Yes. Can't be missed. So we're going to kind of wrap it here, but I do want to emphasize, I'm sure many people could think of other tests that they would like to add to our package. Certainly we can. <laughs> We've had many that we had to kind of ferret in and out, uh, and we may possibly see if we can add one or two more, but at the same time, bear in mind that we're trying to make this affordable to everybody. We're trying to negotiate a really good price with LabCorp so that when we do these blood testing drives, 
we can get as many people participating that would like to as they can. And uh, knock on wood, we may or may not be talking to some other future conferences to see if this is something that we could get uh, moving forward to help out anybody. One small note that I just thought of right now on insulin. Some people, I wouldn't be surprised if they have insulin flagged because it's low. <laughs> um, this is not surprising. Um, so insulin can be low on low carb. If you're eating less carbs, insulin is possibly less necessary in that case. Um, in that case, I think most of the concern is just, you know, type 1 diabetes, but C-peptide is also there if you are making C-peptide. You know, that's a good indicator <laughs> that you're not type 1 diabetic. Um, but yeah, just in case people saw that on theirs, if they do get it back with that, um, keep in mind it can happen, especially with uh, lean mass hyper responders. They're often in like the 1 or 2 range. And yes, this isn't to say that it can't be possible that some that it could be um, letting you know about uh, adult onset type 1 diabetes. It's possible. Uh, that said, I will say I've seen so many lean mass hyperspawner panels by now, I know Siobhan has as well, where they have rock bottom insulin levels and just about everything else metabolically is singing, including even though they, including what I just mentioned earlier, they, they may have higher fasting glucose, but not type one diabetic higher fasting glucose. We're talking again, like low 100s at the max. Um, and yet they, I mean, everything else just falls in line. So I myself, I'm not very concerned about having very low insulin levels. I, I actually believe it's going to be uh, associated with greater longevity, uh, me personally. So I think we'll go ahead and wrap it here. I think you, thank you so much for joining me, Siobhan. And um, we will... Uh, catch up with you guys again next time. Yep. See ya.